This is Asian News Weekly, the podcast featuring news commentary and analysis from the Asia Pacific region. The Philippines prepares final arguments in its case against China, Asian markets dip on the Greek referendum, and is unification necessary on the Korean Peninsula? Plus, Japan and South Korea can work together on some historical issues, allegations of political bribery in Malaysia, and more coming up next. Hey everyone, great to have you with me here on this Friday, July 10th, 2015. My name, of course, is Steve Miller, and let's get things cracking. But before we do, a couple of housekeeping notes. Now, first up, on the first Wednesday of every month at 10.30 p.m. local time, which is 1.30 a.m. universal, I'm participating in a new live water cooler discussion about news in Asia, and it's called What's Up Asia. I'm joined by popular Japan-based video blogger Hiko Simon, and this live podcast, really a Google Hangout, is broadcast on his YouTube channel. The link will be in the show notes, but as well, I do save an audio version of it, and it's available in the Asia Now podcast feed, usually going up about the day afterwards. So again, the first Wednesday of every month, you'll hear us discuss informally a lot of topics regarding what's happening in Asia, primarily focusing on East Asia because that's where we both live, but we do cover a wide range of topics. And it's all unscripted, all informal, and a lot of fun. So if you do join us, we do actually take questions from the viewing audience if you have something specifically on your mind. Also, I've been using Periscope a lot. So my Twitter handle is Steve Miller ANW. And as I explore the world, look at what's taking place. I'll often launch Periscope to show you in real time. So I've been to a few locations around Seoul and hopefully a few more coming up soon. So if you want to see life in Asia, real time, interact with me real time, you can do that. And finally, on Monday, July 13th at 1 p.m. here in Seoul, which is 4 a.m. Universal, I'll be participating in a very well, South Korean unique experience, and that is mukbang, or an eating show. It's caught on like wildfire here over the past few years, and I'll be going to the Africa TV studio to participate in what they're calling the Hunger Games. Now, it'll be broadcast on an Africa TV channel, and that URL is africa.tv slash Steve Miller, A-N-W, A-F-R-E-E-C-A dot TV slash Steve Miller, A-N-W. And again, 1 p.m. Seoul time, 4 a.m. Universal. They're calling it the Hunger Games because it's going to be, well, they're going to try and get me to eat a lot of spicy food. And those who know me know I love spicy food. So we're going to do some challenges, some other things, interacting live via the comments. So if you're free, join me. If not, It'll be up there on an archive. But all that aside, let's get started with the news this week. It has been a long and drawn out process, but next week the Philippines will rest its case on China's activities in the South China Sea. This week, Manila has been in The Hague, making its case against Beijing at the Permanent Arbitration Court. China has thus far refused to participate in the hearings to determine if the tribunal has jurisdiction over this matter. The proceedings are expected to wrap up by Monday, the 13th. Philippine presidential spokesperson Abigail Velt said, We prepared a strong case. We believe we stand on strong legal ground. We believe the tribunal will look at our case with favor. We are confident of the Philippine position on this matter. A decision on this issue is expected in August or early September. If the tribunal decides in favor of the Philippines, the Manila will be asked to argue their case in another round of hearings sometime, well, in the neighborhood of November, with a decision on that matter sometime in the first quarter of 2016. If the Philippines ultimately wins, 
The nation's Supreme Court Senior Associate Justice, Antonio Carpio, says, All those reclamations of China are illegal, and China has no right to stay there, and China must vacate. But of course, that's the big problem, how to enforce the ruling. Once we have the ruling, we will go to the world community. We will sponsor a resolution in the United Nations General Assembly every year that China should vacate. That China should comply with the rule of law, should comply with the ruling of UNCLOS, or the United Nations Convention on Law of the Seas. Now, let's be honest. With regard to the South China Sea, Beijing has been unwavering in its stance. To China, its actions are appropriate and legal, and it will not back down. But this isn't the first time a smaller nation has taken a larger one to task. If you look back to the 1970s, Nicaragua sued and won its case against the United States. In fact, when looking at rulings at international tribunals, there's a 97% compliance rate. And that's really the question, isn't it? Will China comply with the ruling? Rand Corporation's Scott Herald has said many times on this podcast that China will have to comply, that it simply has no other choice but to if it wants to retain its position on the world stage. Not going along with the tribunal's decision would open up the possibility that the world would see China as an unreliable state that acts outside established international norms, which could effectively hurt the nation's bottom line. So the question will be, if the global community really has what it takes to force China to adhere to the ruling and is willing to put muscle behind it. If not, then the tribunal and the UN becomes a laughingstock. Until there is a time when China does pull back, we could actually see the deployment of the United States Navy's anti-submarine warfare continuous trail unmanned vessel, a drone. It's designed to track diesel electric submarines, mainly that are used by Russia and China in the area. The craft is actually known as the Sea Hunter, and it is ready for trials, which is why we may see it in the area. As always, the question on everyone's mind is how China will respond to a verdict that doesn't go their way. Remember, from day one, from the onset of this tribunal, China has not participated, and they've maintained the stance that the tribunal has absolutely no jurisdiction to adjudicate this matter. This past weekend, Greece held its referendum on whether or not to accept new austerity measures in order to secure a bailout and avoid potentially defaulting on previous loans. By now, you know that Greece voted no, sending its future, as well as that of the Eurozone, into doubt. Now, almost immediately after the vote, Asian markets took a dive. In fact, a regional benchmarking index saw its largest single-day drop in more than five months. China's initial reaction was mixed. But, well, this whole week, we've seen the markets in China hemorrhaging. Chinese brokerage firms announced they would buy nearly $20 million in outstanding blue-chip shares. Something certainly needs to be done, for these Chinese markets have fallen nearly 30% since mid-June. The Financial Times reported on Wednesday that more than 40% of China's equity market is frozen. The rest was in a freefall. About 43% of companies on China's two exchanges have been suspended to avoid massive sell-offs. In short, the Chinese market is in a meltdown, with some investors having their entire savings wiped out. Ruchi Sharma said on Twitter, There are four signs of a stock market bubble. China is at the extreme side of all four. In fact, things are so bad that China's securities regulator, prohibited company senior executives and investors who own stakes in businesses exceeding 5% from selling their shares on the secondary market for six months. Other Asian markets did relinquish their previous gains, but nowhere near as much as their Chinese counterparts. Now, one other bit of interesting news did filter its way to the top. The New York Stock Exchange and other systems in the United States were taken offline for a short period of time on Wednesday, 
Security analysts haven't ruled out a cyber attack, noting it takes months to fully evaluate the situation. But hacktivist group Anonymous puts the blame squarely on China. If that is the case, the most lucky Beijing is trying to mitigate their own market problems by instituting havoc elsewhere. Now, switching gears just a little bit, before the Greek referendum founding members of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank were in Beijing to witness the signing of the Articles of Agreement. Fifty countries signed the agreement, the remaining seven held off as they hadn't yet secured permission to sign from their respective governments. As it stands, China holds just over 26% of the voting rights in the organization, essentially giving it a veto authority since some votes would require a supermajority, requiring 75% of the members' votes by two-thirds of the voting members. Items requiring such a supermajority include things like picking the president of the bank, providing funding outside the region, and allocating the bank's income. As you'll recall, one of the chief concerns the United States had about the AIIB was how open it would be. Now, after securing the veto rights, even more eyes will be on China and its behavior. One nation that didn't join the AIIB but has committed to developing Asia is Japan. Last weekend, Tokyo announced plans to extend 750 million yen, or about 6.1 million U.S. dollars, in development aid to the Mekong region. In order to respond to vast infrastructure demand and achieve quality growth in the region, both sides reaffirmed that it is vital to promote quality infrastructure in the Mekong region. Turning to China and its land reclamation efforts, both sides noted concerns expressed over the recent development in the South China Sea, which will further complicate the situation and erode trust and confidence and may undermine regional peace, security, and stability, a summary of the japan mekong Corporation Agreement read. Japan will make these funds available over the next three years and follows two previous development deals in the region dating back to 2009. The United Nations is also raising concerns about the AIIB as well as the newly formed BRICS banks, asking if China-backed development projects overseas will have adequate protections for human rights. The Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights is investigating the link between project financing and safeguards for human rights. Investigations have shown little concern about human rights violations surrounding projects promoted and financed in different countries. Indications are that the newly formed AIIB hasn't worked out safeguards for protecting human rights, despite countries like Germany, the United Kingdom, and France joining as members. Gunnar Thiessen, an officer for the High Commissioner of Human Rights, told The Voice of America, We have not seen any documents about human rights safeguards prepared by the AIIB. The United Nations Agency is also worried about how the two new multilateral banks will deal with borrowing nations that fail to repay loans. They must work out a debt repayment solution without attaching egregious conditionalities, it said. A recent survey by Hanguk Research, conducted on behalf of the Chosen Ilbo and the Korean Political Science Association, Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs, released some very interesting data on how South Koreans feel about unification. Overall, 68% said unification would benefit both Koreas, while only 15.7% feel the process would only help North Korea, and 14.1% said that it would hurt both sides. If we take a look at South Koreans in their 20s, about 41% thought that North Korea would benefit or both sides would suffer. Some 56.2% said reunification would help both sides. Those over 60 had a more rosy opinion. Some 70.5% said reunification would help both sides. When asked how to pay for unification, nearly 75% of respondents said South Korea should shoulder some or most of the burden. But when might all this happen? About a quarter said never. So why bring this up? Well, South Korean President Park Geun-hye has in the past called the unification of the Koreas a bonanza for business. Now, personally, I do not buy that. And I don't think many others did as well. However, this past week, she addressed delegates from Mexico, Indonesia, and Australia saying, The international community should respond with one voice and unified commitment on challenges caused by North Korea's nuclear program.
The president also asked for more support for unification of the peninsula, saying that unification is the fundamental way to address security instability on the Korean peninsula. But is that truly the case? Now, returning to the podcast is Jonathan Miller, fellow on East Asia with the East West Institute. Jonathan, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks a lot, Steve. Always uh, good to be on. All right, let's go ahead and kick things off with this. Now, last week, President Pakenhe said that the fundamental way to end turmoil and conflict on the Korean Peninsula was only through unification. So I want to ask you, is it? Do the Koreas really have to unify? Uh, thanks, Steve. I think that uh, obviously with uh, with President Park, it's uh, it's one of her priorities, her uh, policy priorities that she's uh, put forth is uh, reunification. And I think from an American perspective, uh, from a South Korean perspective, uh, everyone gets why this would be a good thing. But I think that uh, it's the terms on what this re- reunification could be. I think that the the problems come into uh, the feasibility of something like that. And uh, for me, uh, when I look at uh, statements like that and, and policies towards that, we, you know, I, I'm fully supportive of that, but I think it's premised under the idea of a peaceful reunification, which uh, under the current situation doesn't really seem uh, plausible. Um, and, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, the first most and most critical reason is the fact that uh, in Pyongyang, in North Korea, there doesn't seem to be any desire to to do that. Uh, the, you know, their uh, reunification uh, under Park's uh, idea is would be something that would be eventually kind of under uh, ROK's ideals, uh, you know, under a ROK-led regime. Obviously, that there's no interest in that currently in North Korea. Uh, the second issue is uh, is the security threat emanating from North Korea with its nuclear program, uh, with its missile program, uh, and uh, adequately addressing that through deterrence options. Uh, and a third uh, key element, which you know may not be discussed as much, is is China and uh, and the role of what reunification means and what China's position on reunification is, uh, which uh, you know China traditionally is kind of. Uh, walked a hazy line on that, but uh, I think from an American perspective and from a South Korean perspective, we know that China is very nervous about about uh, reunification um, uh, on many fronts. Uh, that, you know, potentially if the reunification is is a messy reunification and involves conflict, that'll obviously uh, impact China. But also, even if it is a peaceful reunification, uh, what that means for China strategically with a uh, with a you know an ROK uh, led regime on its border. You know, while most Americans would you know in principle would be supportive of that as well, it's it's just under under what conditions uh, that would be possible under the current climate. All right, one last question. We're entering the second half of 2015. Time to get your crystal ball out. Uh, Anything you might expect to see from the DPRK as we conclude 2015? Well, I mean, it's a uh, you know, as I said, the North the North Koreans uh, sometimes are uh, are very unpredictable, but you but you uh, you can predict uh, certain things on uh, you know on certain dates, you know, whether it's uh, the anniversary the the um, uh, death anniversaries of some of their leaders, former leaders. Uh, one thing that, from a political rhetoric standpoint, you can expect the North, I'm sure, to kind of come out with something. Uh, in August, when uh, when Japan makes its statement on on World War II, I'm sure that there will be a, a statement uh, coming out there. Uh, you know, most likely you you, you will have the continual cyclical um, uh, threats uh, when uh, whenever there's uh, bilateral uh, war games happening between the U.S. and the ROK. Uh, so I think those are things that you know are almost routinely that we can kind of expect as uh, North Korea watches these things kind of happen, um, you know, almost on cue every every year. Um, but, uh, you know, otherwise, I'm not sure as far as like, you know, what uh, something something larger than that. Uh, um, you know, I think the, the next nuclear test is always something that we're, you know, everybody's uh, thinking about. And I think that realistically could happen pretty much at any time if the political conditions uh, were right for the North Koreans if they felt that that was a it was a, a good card for them to play. So that's that's something I think that we're always looking out for. All right, thank you so much, Jonathan Miller with the East West Institute. Always a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thanks, Steve. Always a pleasure to be on. 
There is a whole lot more to that conversation, and if you'd like to check it out, be sure to surf on over to asianewsweekly.net and look for the Korea Unification Podcast as part of Asia Now. Now, one other piece of DPRK news. A North Korean expert on biochemical weapons defected to Finland last month, carrying with him about 15 gigabytes of human experiments results. Mr. E fled via the Philippines, and a rights group says he plans on testifying at the European Parliament this month to highlight North Korea's abuses of its own citizens. It's time once more for the Asia Brief, a collection of stories from the Asia-Pacific region you may have missed. Coming up, Malaysia's prime minister is in hot water after allegations of graft arise. South Korea and Japan come to terms on new UNESCO sites. Operators of a fatal ferry sinking are held accountable. And much more are coming up next. We're going to kick things off this week with a report of alleged graph by Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak. The Wall Street Journal and the Malaysia-based Sarawak Report published findings alleging the Prime Minister received over $700 million from a government-owned investment fund named the 1MDB. During the tight 2013 election, the papers say hefty sums of cash were transferred directly into Najib's account. The 1MDB fund, which is chaired by Najib, faces accusations of corruption, mismanagement, and is over $11 billion in debt. It is also under investigation by government agencies, including the Auditor General and the Central Bank. 1MDB responded by saying, The fund never provided any funds to the Prime Minister and called the reports highly irresponsible and an attempt to undermine the company. In a message posted to Facebook, Najib called the allegations concerted efforts by individuals to undermine confidence in our economy, tarnish the government, and remove a democratically elected prime minister. These latest claims, attributed to unnamed investigators as a basis to attack the prime minister, are a continuation of this political sabotage. Najib says he'll go after the publications. But that didn't stop commercial crime officers from conducting a raid on the 1MDB office. The prime minister's political secretary said the report was done with bad intention and based upon unsubstantiated and dubious sources. We will take legal action. Tian Chua, vice president of the opposition People's Justice Party, spoke out on the matter. We call upon the prime minister to step aside take leave, to allow an independent investigation. The Prime Minister has to be out of the way to allow whistleblowers and investigators to act independently. Otherwise, there will be suspicions of intimidation and foul play. I'm concerned that whistleblowers and people who have information won't dare to come forward because of the immense power that the government holds in its hands. So far, three companies have been raided over the alleged transfer of funds and assets frozen in six different accounts. The Wall Street Journal's Hong Kong bureau chief, Ken Brown, told CNBC in an interview that the business paper is standing by its report, saying, We are very careful and we believe the investigation and the documents we have are very, you know, solid and come from a very reliable investigation and not a political investigation. It was announced this past Monday that Japan's list of Meiji-era industrial sites would make UNESCO's World Heritage List, despite initial opposition from Seoul over the use of forced Korean laborers. The bid initiated a diplomatic row that the two countries have been working on for months. Tokyo acknowledged Seoul's request and noted that Koreans and others were brought against their will and forced to work under harsh conditions in the 1940s at some sites. Japan will also incorporate measures to remember the victims, such as the establishment of an information center, it said, an assurance that led Seoul to lift its opposition to the listing. The South Korean Foreign Ministry said, for the first time, Japan mentioned the historical fact that Koreans were drafted against their will and forced into labor under harsh conditions in the 1940s. Japan's foreign minister was quick to note a distinction between the UNESCO site's language and legal responsibility to those forced to endure the harsh conditions and that there has been no change 
in Tokyo's stance that the issue of reparations has been fully and finally resolved in the 1965 bilateral pact with Seoul to normalize diplomatic ties. But let's be honest. The notation is essentially a footnote, and Japan is already spinning the issue, just like it did with China with the dispute over the Senkaku and the Ayu Islands. Tokyo says the expression forced to work in this statement is different from the expression forced labor or compulsory labor, which is banned by the 1932 Forced Labor Convention. Ah, yes, semantics at work once more. Something China jumped on right away and condemned. You know, I find it absolutely astonishing that Seoul didn't learn from Beijing's mistake. It was clear to me from the absolute onset that something like this was Japan's endgame. Now this particular deal with Tokyo has even caught even more attention. The Shokas Anjuku Academy in the Yamaguchi Prefecture happened to be one of the sites added under these Meiji sites. The academy taught a number of Japan's key leaders during Japan's expansion in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Some activists said the listing of the academy as World Heritage Sites is tantamount to allowing Japan to justify and beautify its militaristic past. Foreign Ministry spokesman No Kwang Il said, We are reviewing ways to deal with the issue on various levels. We believed that it's not effective to take issue with that at the World Heritage Committee. Really? It seems like the appropriate time and place for me. Could it be that since the Academy wasn't on the radar of the South Korean public, that it simply wasn't addressed, and the negotiations with Tokyo allowed for it to be listed? If one asserts that its listing allows Japan to justify and beautify its militaristic past, then it seems that it would be more damning than forced labor sites, unless no one was paying attention. If you recall, the former Seoul bureau chief of the Senkai Shimbun, Tatsuya Kato, was charged with defaming South Korean President Park Geun-hye after he printed rumors about her whereabouts during the Sewol ferry sinking in an online edition of his newspaper. Since then, he's been embroiled in a case to determine if his statements were in public interest. For that, in South Korea, defamation can occur even if statements are factually true. The litmus test is if the information serves the public good or was done to damage the other person's reputation. The trial is set to come to a close after two more hearings scheduled for July 27th and August 17th. Longtime Seoul reporter Donald Kirk said in court, Correspondents of foreign media organizations often cite news content reported by the South Korean media when writing their own articles. Kato's column was of little significance on its own, but it drew a great deal of attention after it became the matter of a criminal case. Outside of South Korea, the general consensus is that the matter should be dismissed, but only time will tell if the South Korean courts will agree. Fourteen Thai students were arrested in late June after staging protests against the junta. Well, they've now been released. The military court released them earlier this week. While calls continue to come in for the government to drop all charges against the use, they still face sedition charges. Police had argued to keep them under lock and key for an additional 12 days. Puan Tong Pawakapan, a political scientist at Chula Longkorn University, said, At the beginning, the junta was reluctant to release the students temporarily, but I think they are concerned that the longer they detain the students, the more people will come out to voice their opposition to the junta. If convicted, the students face up to seven years behind bars. Last week, North Korea told Tokyo it would once more not have a report ready on Japanese abductees. The message from Pyongyang read, We are sincerely conducting a comprehensive investigation, but it will take a little more time. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe instructed his ministers to press the DPRK further and get results. We'll stick to the principles of dialogue and pressure and action for action and do all we can to realize the return of all abductees, he said. Reports are that the clock on this diplomatic mission will run out next month. Now, I said from the get-go, this was a bad idea for Japan and to be ready for a bait-and-switch scenario. North Korea wanted something for nothing, and, well, they've gotten a year's worth. It's the same tactic North Korea has been using for years, 
And to think that Pyongyang would earnestly do any work on this issue, I think, was extremely naive. It's high time the world really takes a stand against North Korea. The practice of relieving sanctions with a promise from the Kims to behave just hasn't worked. Like a broken record stuck on repeat, it's high time to change tactics and treat North Korea differently. Demand actions before sanctions are lifted. There are, of course, more stories from Asia this week, and you'll be able to find some of them in an extended version of the Asia Brief on our website. Well, my friends, it's that time once more. The podcast is winding down. But before I go, let's take a quick look at some of your comments from the previous week. First up, Daniel Beck on the proposed suit by the South Korean comfort women to sue Japan and its emperor. Just because Japan refers to them as workers does not mean that they were workers. It doesn't mean that they weren't forced into something so terrifying as sexual slavery. And does it matter if it's about the money? The damages caused by Japanese military during World War II to the victims of war, including the sex slaves, cannot be fully compensated. Furthermore, the fact that the Japanese government, media, and people still deny the wrongdoings and blame the victims is the reason why Japan and Korea cannot work together. Perdamont then replied, Turn it around, and just because Korea called them slaves doesn't mean they were slaves. The money matters because it was paid and the Korean government screwed over its own people. Not Japan's problem anymore. Zachary Thompson also commented, If they want the emperor, who wasn't the emperor during the war, to bow down to them, can't imagine what they want Abe to do. Red White Dude commented on U.S.-China relations, China cannot be trusted in any of the issues. They keep pointing fingers and faulting the other countries. Chaloner also said, Obama will not do anything. He is all talk. Remember Ukraine. And finally, Stump Jumper said this about the U.S. singling out China on the OPM hack. The hypocrisy of the United States continues on. A country that spies on allies, enemies, and its own citizens is outraged that others might do the same. Seems we may have become the rogue nation that we accuse others of being. As an American, it's sad to watch. Thank you so much for taking the time to leave your comments this week. And if you have a thought on any of the stories mentioned in this week's podcast, please drop a note in the comments on Facebook or Twitter. If you enjoyed this week's podcast, please share it with your friends. And if you haven't, subscribe. Subscribing is free and easy to do. Just go to our website, asianewsweekly.net, click on the subscribe tab, or do so in your favorite podcast application. When you subscribe, the next episode is delivered automatically to you. Now, to keep up with more news from the region, be sure to follow Asian News Weekly on Facebook or Twitter. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback about the show, I'd love to hear from you. The email address is podcast at asianewsweekly.net. Well, my friends, that is all the time I have this week. Thank you so much for joining me. And until next time, remember to be true to yourself and to always be awesome.